Welcome everyone back to the Rob Save Sports Podcast. And today we got another great episode for you guys today. And we have another special guest on the show. Nothing but the best on this pod. We got Joey Lynn here. And Joey, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. I appreciate you having me. Definitely uh, always enjoy any time that I can hop on a podcast and talk some Clippers basketball. Because as you know, man, that's what I love to do. So thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Joey. You know, he has that YouTube channel, The Clips Convoys. So all you Clipper fans, if you want to check that out, it's a great YouTube channel, great videos, great stuff from you, Joey. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. And so, you know, today we we are just about a week away from NBA basketball from starting up again, which is crazy considering the circumstances and, you know, last season ending kind of like in mid-October. So the teams that were playing in the playoffs last season really don't have a lot of time to recover and get back to this season. But whatever, regardless, we're starting on December 22nd. And so with free agency going on and with the draft. So the first, but the first thing that we're going to talk about is something that came out like very recently, the past couple of days with the athletic article uh, written by Jovan Buha, who writes for the Clippers. And it kind of, it kind of talks about a lot about, you know, the past season, I would say problems or issues and stuff about chemistry issues and locker room stuff. And Joe, I want, I want you to tell me kind of like if you've read it and like your first impressions on this. Yeah. So I did read it and a lot of it was actually similar to some of the stuff we had already heard. Uh, with the, you know, Kawhi living in San Diego, the team not really practicing. Uh, there weren't very many new stories, at least entirely new stories within that article. Um, but it was interesting to see the timing of it all, um, at least from what I've heard from those within the media. Um, obviously, this was coming from within the locker room. So players talking to the media. And I would definitely um, discourage a lot of the noise I hear from Clipper fans who want to say it's entirely made up because um, as, as somebody who knows and respects Yovan and his work, I don't think he would just entirely make stuff up. I, in fact, know that most of the um, stuff that he reports is actually from very reputable sources. So um, this did seem as if it came from within the locker room, but I guess that kind of raises the question, all right, well, where? from within the locker room. I think there's a culprit. Um, <laughs> Clipper fans don't probably have to look too far uh, to take their best guess on who it was that was leaking this out to the media. But um, with that being said, I'm encouraged to know that Trez is no longer part of that locker room and Doc Rivers is no longer part of that locker room. So I think that's going to be refreshing for the team. Um, yeah, they're still going to have some of the same issues, but at the same time, uh, two of what I deem the biggest issues are are now no longer on the team. So that's definitely encouraging for me. Yeah. So are you are you confirming that it was Trez who was linking the stuff to the media? Well, I can't I can't confirm that. No, mm -hmm. but it definitely does seem that way because, especially like I said, I brought up the timing because with the season starting in in about ten days, less than ten days now. Um, I can't imagine any current Clipper players being interested in continuing to bash their teammates from last season, knowing that they've kind of turned that page and are now looking to, to move forward. Um, and I do know that obviously Trez was speaking to the media um, in that Chris Haynes story uh, on the on the bubble afterwards where he was talking about how Paul George you know you can't tell him anything he's always right like that was obviously coming from Trez in his camp um, so I know that Trez has spoken to the media in the past regarding chemistry issues this seemed like another Trez bit but I can't confirm that um, through any sources or anything like that but it does it does seem to be the case if you just kind of deduce a little bit <laughs> <laughs> kind of do a little bit of detective work you can kind of connect yeah. the dots a little bit but you Absolutely. can't really confirm 100 percent just because like no one's gonna say that they said those things like directly but you know i i do agree with you like when it came out 
probably like in January, kind of like the first bit of it, kind of like the rumblings mm. of kind of disconnect with the team. With uh, Jovan Buha, uh, at the beginning, I was a little bit, okay, I don't think this is that big of a deal. But then as the season got on, and then during the playoffs, and now with everything coming out, it kind of makes a lot more sense that how much there was just kind of disorganized yeah. throughout the season. And that could be, you know, that, that was pretty much a lot of things. I don't think it was one specific thing that was happening. It was Paul George not being ready to play for the season at the start. And so they had to wait for him. And then Kawhi had to sit out when Paul George came back. And I don't know how many exactly, how many games they played together exactly this season, but it wasn't a lot. Yeah. So that definitely impacted what we saw in the bubble. And I don't think you can really understate that. Um, and that's another thing that gives me excitement for the season going forward is that, um, you know, Paul George caught a lot of flack last year for saying that it wasn't a championship or bust season, even for myself. I mean, that was frustrating to hear as a fan because it did seem that way from all the marketing from uh, the Clippers themselves, as well as some of the comments here from the players. They expected to be able to at least, you know, be competing uh, for – a championship and for them to fall short and then hear him say that it was frustrating but at the same time you can kind of look back at that now with a little bit of hindsight and see that all right well with everything that had gone on maybe you can justify that comment a little bit and say okay maybe it wasn't a championship or bust season now they've had a full off season together uh, I guess maybe not full off season is a little bit shorter than usual but they've had an off season together they're entering the season entirely healthy which is something that they could not say for really any point of last season. So for them to be able to now uh, have a little bit more continuity, I really don't think there's any excuses now. It's like if they don't at least reach the Western Conference Finals, I mean, it, it, something went seriously wrong. So, um, yeah, it was frustrating with everything that went on, but I, I am encouraged going forward. Yeah, and although, you know, this article doesn't put the Clippers in good, I guess, standing with the NBA and just like casual NBA fans at the same time, it's like, if you would have asked 30 out of 30 teams, I don't think you would have any players kind of like if you have star players on that team, having the other players kind of be a little bit of resentment towards those players who are getting that star treatment, because you got to believe that it's not just the Clippers like Kawhi and Paul George that are getting that type of star treatment. I mean, the whole league has a bunch of stars in it. So I think that kind of seems blown out of proportion. But at the same time, with PG and Kawhi, I think this season there has to be a bit more of accountability within those two. And then especially the coaching, because, you know, with the, the season ending so like disappointing for Clipper fans, I think a lot of it in the beginning was, you know, oh, should should the Clippers trade like one of the two stars to to try and like see if that would work? But all the other, all the trades that were kind of just like being thrown out, all the rumor trades, like none of those trades seemed like it would be a positive for the Clippers. But I think the most important thing that they did this off season was not trading anybody, but firing Doc Rivers. Because there's there's always been this disconnect and kind of like disappointment with him for this with the Clippers during his tenure, like to have all that talent for all these years and not get to the conference finals. I think at some point there's got to be accountability with him also. Oh yeah, absolutely, and that's actually what I noticed um, and mentioned in my last YouTube video was because. A lot of people have said because of the great collapse that the Clippers need to, to do something drastic, right? They need to find a way to trade for a third star. They need to find a way to, you know, really shake this roster up. But, man, I said they did something drastic. They did something significant, and, and it was firing Doc Rivers or, or replacing him with Ty Lue. So um, that's very encouraging to me to know that they actually are that serious because he's been their guy, right? Like, he's been their guy um for the last better part of a decade so for him to get fired it shows how serious this 
team and this organization is about winning. They weren't going to risk another collapse like what we had last year. Yeah, because they could they could have ran it back with uh, Doc Rivers. They could have <clears throat> they could have you know had the excuse, oh, this is not normal at all. It's like there's so many different parts and pieces that didn't go their way with the circumstances. But at the same time, it seems like it's a pattern of him for the playoffs. And I think it, his voice in the locker room just kind of went. It kind of went worse and worse to the point where they needed a new voice. And like, even though Tyron Lue was on the bench uh, last season, you know, he's still the assistant coach. Like Doc Rivers is going to have the final say on everything. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that's, like I said, what excites me is that Ty Lue already has said a lot of encouraging things to the media, stuff that I think we as fans want to hear. Um, some more confidence in Zoo, um, just his his modernized view of the game. I, I talked about it in my YouTube video, but he has always had his teams at the very top of the league in three-point attempts per game. The Clippers were one of the best, I think second best in percentage last year, or at least top five, but they were at the very bottom of the league in, in three-point attempts. So it's stuff like that, like tangible stuff, not just you know, overplaying Trez or, you know, having having bad rotations. There were some real tangible basketball reasons why the Clippers underperformed last year, and, and one of them is what I just mentioned. So already hearing Ty Lu speak on some of these things, some of these things, and then as well as seeing his track record on a lot of these things, it, it's encouraging. I think there is some real reason for optimism uh, with this with this coaching move. Oh, yeah, and especially, like, the entire coaching staff, like, in general. Because with, with the additions that they made, I think there have, there's a better, I guess, overall coaching staff. You know, with Dan Craig, who was with Miami. Uh, and also, the person that I wanted on the staff is uh, Chauncey Billups on the, on, the, on the coaching staff. I think that, to me, was probably – in regards to getting getting that leadership on the team, you know this is going to be his first year uh, coaching, but from he, from me listening to him uh, doing the play by play for the Clippers, I think he has a great understanding of how basketball is played today. Like even though he played in kind of like a different generation, to say in while, while he was playing, I think he's been able to adapt and I think he'll bring that leadership and kind of like his mentality to the team. I think that's a really good positive. And I think all the coaches on that staff are going to be extremely valuable for the Clippers now, but also in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's what they were looking for because, you know, if you want to talk about just Chauncey, he's a guy who's not too far removed from the game. So I think there's a good connect there with him and the players. Um, and I guess in a, in a smaller way, similar with Ty Lue, is that, you know, it just wasn't that long ago that he was in the league as well. So um, there's definitely a, a relational aspect there that I think is going to be important. But even more importantly, like you mentioned, is you have that basketball side to it where these guys actually have a really positive basketball track record. And you've seen what they've done throughout their career, both on the court and then also on the sidelines. And that goes, I mean, from Ty Lu all the way on down, um, you know, Billups, Atkinson, Craig, like you mentioned. I mean, these are some guys who have some really positive track records and, and positive resumes as, as it pertains to, to coaching. So I'm encouraged by that. I think it's going to be, I mean, a breath of fresh air for Clipper fans who have been frustrated feels that they've seen the same thing time and time again uh this is going to be different and you know we don't know exactly what it's going to look like but we do know it's going to be different and that's what they needed they needed something different yeah they needed to change things up if they were going to change kind of like the their main roster <clears throat> i think changing the staff was probably a much a bigger step because i think that could have a just as much of an impact as either making up like a big splash or trade or big signings for the team. And so going with the staff, we can move to like the players on the team. And so, you know, with the free agency, we've had at the start of it, 
it kind of looked, it didn't look too great. You know, you had Trez signing to the Lakers and then Jermichael Green signing to Nuggets. Then they gave the contract to Marcus Morris, which a lot of people seem like they said that they overpaid for him. But just by looking at the contracts that other people are getting, you know, you're not going to get a starting for paying just maybe a little bit over what Marcus Morris got. Because I'm looking at the contracts right now, of like all the starting fours, they're all getting 20 or like 18 plus. And for him, he's making around, I think, average 16 or 17. And also, there weren't that many to begin with. So I think overall, they addressed most of the issues that they've had that they needed to add to the roster. So what do you think, Joey? Do you think? Yeah, so with the Marcus Morris deal, um, I guess in theory, maybe they overpaid a bit. But the thing is that they had to. They had to bring him back. With what they gave up for him, giving up a first-round pick um, to get him and to not only get him but to get him to fill a very vital and important role. And we saw how important that role was in the playoffs last year when he was at times their second-best player, their second-best scorer. I mean, there were there were multiple games in the playoffs where if they didn't have him – stepping up and making shots I mean they they would have lost those games um so to have him back is definitely a must I mean they had no choice they had to get him back so um you can argue whether or not they overpaid by you know a few million per year or maybe you think the contract's too long you know maybe you have a case there but I, that doesn't really change the way I view it because they had to have him back um so I'm happy to have him back I'm encouraged to have him back after he's already had a little bit of run with the guys Obviously, he kind of got thrown into a role last year that uh, was maybe a little bit bigger than he had time to prepare for, but I think he did a great job. So um, I'm excited to see him back. And, you know, the people who think the Clippers overpaid, and those are the people who are going to hate on whatever they did anyway. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm good with it. Yeah. Do you, who do you think was going to make the biggest impact as far as, like, new signings or new trades on the Clippers? So I think Serge Ibaka is an easy one to look at because obviously he's the Trez replacement, right? They replaced Trez with a guy who's, I mean, a more championship friendly player. It's just, just put it, put it like that. Um, he can obviously defend the rim a little bit better. He's a seven footer. He's got a, a really good track record of, of interior defense, um, but he can stretch the floor. I think that's going to be the biggest thing that they're going to get from him that they didn't get from Trez is that as, you know, gifted as Trez is offensively, he obviously doesn't do a whole lot outside of the paint, which really limits what the Clippers are able to do as a whole offensively. So uh, Ibaka is going to be big, but I'm really high on Luke Kennard. And if you watch my, my last YouTube video, I, I really do think that he's going to do great things for the Clippers if he stays healthy. I watched a lot of him in Detroit being a Blake Griffin fan and always wanting to uh, check in on their games. So I've seen him play a lot. And, man, he is, he is a lot better than people give him credit for. I think he's kind of been pegged as, as just a shooter. Um, and yeah, he can shoot, but he can facilitate, he can create his own shot. He can make plays for others. And I think that's where you're going to see his biggest impact this year. Um, and it's what I talked about. Um, I don't have the stats in front of me, but what I mentioned in my video is that only around 50% of his three point baskets last year were off of catch and shoot attempts, as opposed to Landry Shamit, he was at like 80, you know, 85% of his uh, three-point baskets coming off of catch-and-shoot attempts. So that means Luke Kennard is creating a lot of shots for himself, which is something that Shamit didn't really do. So I'm very excited to see what he can do within this offense, hopefully get some minutes alongside Kawhi and PG, and then uh, see, see, see what happens from there. But, yeah, so those two guys I'm super stoked to see. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I, I didn't watch a lot of Piston games, but I do know of Luke Kennard because of his – uh, fantasy basketball because he did he did provide kind of like like solid value as a fantasy pickup so then I did watch a little bit of him and just by going with that I think he adds a lot more like offensive versatility besides uh, Shamit who's kind of like just like a spot up catch and shoot three three guy like he can handle the ball really well like his assist to turnover ratio is like very good for someone who isn't really considered like a natural point guard, but his ability to kind of 
create off the dribble on threes was very pretty good to me like i think him him and lou him and lou i wonder about you know as far as defense goes but i think if you put him either on the bench or in the starting lineup i think he is probably going to have a very good season but also depending on his health like i know he said uh on monday you know he's 100% healthy which is good to hear but i i kind of want have have my eyes to see for myself to see how well he plays and how well he moves but i think the biggest x factor on the clippers is probably going to be luke Kennard this season yeah i think he's going to be big and going back to one of the points that you made about uh the potential bench backcourt defensively with with Kennard and Lou Williams it's obviously a concern but one thing that I want to mention something I've been hoping to mention here sometime soon is that I think a big reason why the Clippers bench struggled defensively so bad last year is that they didn't have an anchor is that you have Lou who is definitely a very poor perimeter defender but when you have an anchor in the middle like Ibaka it really helps cover up some of the mistakes from guys like Lou and Kennard. And it's not going to solve their their defensive, you know, insufficiencies, but I think it will make it a little bit less drastic because, you know, when you got guys like Luca that you're probably going to see in the playoffs, guys like Jamal Murray that we saw in the playoffs, if they're just continuously abusing the perimeter defense and then getting inside the paint and having no issues there, really changes things for your overall defense when you have a a defensive anchor like Ibaka in the middle I think that helps a little bit it's like I said it's not gonna entirely fix that problem but I think it will make it a little bit less drastic yeah for sure like if you have that center that you know can defend like the pick and roll or also just defend penetration in general I think you know the lack of defense with the guards is it won't gonna, it won't be as bad, but him, I think Ibaka was kind of like vital for the Clippers after uh, Jamichael and Trez left. I do think they might need maybe like a backup, backup big, because as far as the centers go, it's really just Zoo and Ibaka. And then if you want to count their uh, rookie, like Orturo as like their backup backup center. But, you know, I think the depth that they have right now is probably a little bit better than last season. And also, especially if you talk about Batum, because him getting, getting the veteran or minimum contract, I think that's, that's a very low risk, high reward pickup. If he plays to even the uh, level that he did a couple of years ago, because he's a solid wing forward combo who can who is a very good playmaker and can defend a little bit and can shoot. So if he turns out well, I think he's also a great piece that the Clippers got. Yeah, so Batum is definitely going to be one of the biggest question marks to look at because he's going to be in the rotation. I don't think there's much doubt about that. He's essentially the Jermichael Green replacement as of right now, at least – the way the roster is struct- structured, they lost Trez, replaced him with Ibaka, lost Green, seemingly replaced him with Batum. So he's going he's gonna to play. Um, and what version of him they get, I think, is going to matter. Um, and I'm a little bit skeptical because of how poor he played last year. Um, but like you said, on a minimum deal, you know, it's not like it's this – you know, big gamble for the Clippers, right? It's like they're bringing him in in hopes that he can return to even his 2018-19 form where, you know, he shot 39% from deep. That's really all they need from him, right, is to just shoot a respectable clip from out there uh, and and don't do anything that's a negative out there on the floor. As long as he can just play that role, I think it'll be a positive for them. Um, And it kind of reminds me of what we saw with Patrick Patterson where it's like he came in you know, I was really skeptical. I didn't think he was going to be any good. And then, you know, he shot 39% from deep as well. So if, if Batum can do that 
with all the intangibles he brings, both, you know, defensively and, and playmaking wise, it'll be a good signing. And I think it'll be important for the Clippers that that happens. So we're just going to have to wait and see. Mm-hmm. And then also, you know, we can talk about uh, the last thing, uh, Zubak. So in the playoffs, you know, it really showed how much, how much more valuable that Zubak was to Clippers than to Trez. I know you could, I know you've said it on your videos. You look at like the lineups and the plus minuses. And, you know, even though Zoo was playing against Jokic, who's like a top five center in the league, he was holding his own as far as not hemorrhaging points while they were on the team, while they were matching up together. And I think, you know, it looked like Zoo was getting almost getting gassed like at the end of the Denver series because he wasn't getting these type of minutes in the regular season because Doc was only playing him. I think I have it up here. His average was like 18 minutes a game. Like, I think, I think all Clipper fans know how much more minutes that zoo needed to get throughout the season. And it kind of showed in the playoffs and you can almost expect a big increase in minutes for zoo. Yeah, dude, it was frustrating. Yeah, it was frustrating, man. That's <clears throat> that's uh, definitely the most difficult thing for me to continue to sit with. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of people miss this. Everybody wants to say, oh, Trez got scapegoated once the playoffs started. If you were around any Clippers media realm throughout the regular season, we had multiple games where we were screaming for Doc to put Zoo back in and take a tries out. Like, this is not – this was not new. And that's what's frustrating me about some of the, the, the narratives that I see out there is that, oh, Clipper fans have scapegoated Trez because Doc made him guard Jokic. No, this was an issue far before the Denver series, and it was an issue in the Mavs series as well. If you remember, he would put him in against Boban, right? When Boban came in, Trez would come in, and it was bad news. So this was not a one-off. And I, I want to set that record straight right now because so many people are getting that wrong. I mean, if you if you go back, yeah, we loved Trez. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deny that. I mean, I love Trez. He was a fan favorite. I mean, especially in that 2018-19 season, he was one of the guys. And I, I really did think that um he was gonna be a big part of what the Clippers did, but it had to be in the right role. And that never happened. And so yeah, it was frustrating, man. I mean, Clipper fans were talking about this for a while. It was a concern for a while. And you know, I actually, you know, I had some stuff aged poorly last year, obviously. I mean, I was super confident in the team. And when they collapsed, and I didn't anticipate them collapsing in the second round. But I did have, to have some stuff that, that I, I nailed pretty spot on. And one of them was my preview for the second round series with Denver. I talked about it in the video. I said, Doc Rivers is the only person who can stop the Clippers in this series and I said it will happen if he abuses that Trez Jokic matchup because it's not going to go well I looked at the regular season numbers the regular season numbers show the same thing that the postseason numbers show those two guys can't play together if Trez is on the floor with Jokic it's bad news for the Clippers and I talked about that in the preview and it really is remarkable some of the snarky remarks that Doc made to the media about how he has you know five guys on his analytics team that are looking at stats and and all that and it's truly remarkable I mean if that's the case I don't know what those guys are looking at because you have the data right there man Tress can't play with Jokic not a single minute or else it's gonna be bad news so yeah man I could go all day uh on that you know it's something we've talked about as a fan base for the past few months but um that's not going to happen again. At least I I don't think so. So I'm yeah, super excited to see, see Zubox get some, some starter minutes because he deserves it. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can get that data for free on NBA.com. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's it's not hard to find, man. It's like, I'm a, I'm a 20 year old college student, right? It's like, I, I'm not some, you know, advanced stats guru with this, you know, unlimited access to crazy data that, that you have. Um, as a a professional organization. I mean, this stuff is not hard to find. And that's what makes it remarkable is that I don't know how it went so, so wrongly. But, you know, like I said, that's in the past. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't happen again. And and it really can't because, you know, the Clippers don't have 
a, a defensive liability as their backup big anymore. So, I mean, that's also encouraging. Yeah, I think I think most Clipper fans are not going to miss uh, Doc Rivers' stubbornness as far as, as, far as like – player rotation and just no. kind of like player personnel and stuff no, like it's, that and it's been like that forever it's it's seriously been like that forever it, and, and that's what makes me so frustrated is that people who don't watch the clippers say that we all of a sudden just turned on doc and turned on trust no man like you weren't around not you these people weren't around in the 2018-19 season when we were yelling about Avery Bradley starting over Shea like that was at the very beginning of the season this this dude Doc was playing Bradley like 35-40 minutes a game you know what I mean it's like this stuff has been happening for a long time go back to the Lob City years he would bring in his former Celtics buddies and, and play them big time minutes you had Paul Pierce big baby you know, I mean, he gave Nate Robinson a shot. It's like he brought in all these guys that it's like, dude, they were getting real minutes and it was bad. And and you had young guys on the roster um, that probably would have performed better in those spots. And and like I said, just as recently as, as the 2018-19 season, when we had Avery Bradley, the management had to take Avery Bradley from him in order to have Doc stop playing him so much. Like, it's crazy to me, bro. Like, this, it's the stubbornness that you mentioned. That's the only way to put it. It's just – it's stubbornness, man. And um, to have that no longer be an aspect – I mean, I just tweeted it yesterday, dude. Like, to have a full Clippers season without Doc Rivers is, is going to be a, a, a win in itself right there, man. I mean, come on. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I don't think you mentioned uh, either uh, Jeff Green was on the team, too. Another former Celtic. Yeah, another <laughs> former Celtic. And, <laughs> they, and they traded a first-round pick for him. Yeah, no, I know. And we had to tra- – dude, and that was the Doc GM era, man. Don't even get me started on that because that I, I still think we're feeling the ramifications <laughs> of having Doc as our GM for as long as we did. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, I mean, y'all know how I feel about that. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, I think <laughs> – you know, we don't we don't have to talk about Doc anymore. That's the Sixers problem. Yeah. Whenever okay. when when that comes up, like mid in mid season, and yeah. you know Simmons is trying to play, still trying to play point guard. Yeah. And then uh, MB is still trying to shoot threes. It's that's that's their problem that they they can worry about <laughs> for the season. Uh yeah, no kidding, man. I think Philly's a an interesting team. I I do agree that. Uh, they got some real issues. And one thing that was frustrating for me is that if you – this is kind of a little bit of a tangent. I'll, I'll keep it short. But if you go back to the Raptors playoff run in 2019, I was rooting for Toronto to lose because I thought that would give Kawhi a better chance to come to the Clippers. So when they were playing Philly in round two, I was really pulling for Philly with them having Tobias and Boban and Mike Scott, you know, three beloved Clippers. You know, I really wanted Philly to win that series. Man, it was frustrating watching MB pump fake out on the perimeter when I knew he could have punished Gasol and other guys like that down low. Um, but man, that was that was brutal to watch. So yeah, like I said, that's 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 Philly's problem. That's Doc's problem. They can they can figure that out uh, this year. I'm just glad we don't got to worry about it anymore. Yeah, and to to go with like the general NBA season because we had you know we had a lot of free agent changes, a bunch of trades. And so I just wanted to get your opinion on like kind of the overall NBA because which which team do you feel like made the most during this offseason to get better? Yeah, so I was actually talking to somebody at my work about this just yesterday, and it's really interesting to see that everybody talked about, all right, we finally got league-wide parity, right? It's like once KD left Golden State, there's no longer a guaranteed championship. And while I agree with that, it's still very interesting to see the way the league is constructed. In the last 10 years, with the one outlier being Dirk's championship in 2011, every championship has been won by either Steph Curry, LeBron James, or Kawhi Leonard. And if you want to add KD to that list, you can, but he didn't win any on his own. He either he won two with Steph. So you can add KD in there because I do think he's in that tier. But if you don't have one of those four guys, your team's probably not going to win at all. And we've seen that, like I said, for the last decade, with the one outlier being 2011. So while I do think teams like Phoenix made good moves, um, you know, Golden State, they made a nice pivot getting Oubre. Um, You know, Brooklyn's going to be back, uh, see what they do with the whole Harden situation. There are some teams that made some some good moves. But like I said, if you're not one of the teams that 
has one of those top tier guys, you're probably not going to win at all. So while there are some teams that made some nice moves around the edges and I think are going to be better than they were last year, um, I still think it's, it's the Clippers and Lakers in the West, and you're probably going to see the East a little bit more wide open, um, depending on what happens with the Harden and Brooklyn situation. If that happens, you probably can pencil them in as Eastern Conference champions. But um, until that point, I think you're going to have, you know, Brooklyn, Milwaukee. You got to give Miami some respect. Um, and, and, you know, maybe Philly and Boston kind of competing for that Eastern Conference title. So, um, but in the West, man, I really, it is, it, as long as there's no more malpractice with the Clippers, it seems as if it's going to be, you know, the Lakers and the Clips. Hopefully we finally get that this time around. But, yeah, it's kind of my opinion on the way the league is, is starting to shape up. Yeah, I kind of I kind of agree with you. Like all the other teams, they made uh, pretty good, free agency stuff and trades but at the same time I don't think if you look at maybe how the standings are going to shape up I think it's going to be pretty much the same with the west and in the east there might be a couple drop-offs like I think okay OKC is probably not making the playoffs this year and then it's really would pretty much be the same with the Lakers and Clippers and then probably Denver and then I don't know. Well, we we could talk about it too with the Rockets, you know, with the Wall and Westbrook trade that happened like this morning or the other day. It seems like the Rockets are trying to get James Harden to stay with John Wall. I don't necessarily think that that will help. Just depending on, we really don't know how he's going to perform yeah. with like two months off. Oh no, two two seasons off of like a really bad injury and. Yeah him and Westbrook are almost you could say they're very similar in styles like they're not great shooters but they get to the rim and they can play make they're really the same so I don't see that making a great impact on either the Rockets or Wizards but what do you think Joey yeah the Rockets uh the Rockets are giving me big lob city vibes because they've kind of they've expended I think their championship window I think they have I mean, they've milked every last ounce out of their championship window. Uh, and we saw it last year. I mean, they, they really were no match for the Lakers. Um, if they were going to win a title, it was going to come in probably, you know, 17 or 18 um, when they had Chris Paul and they were, you know, one game away from the finals or, or two games away, whatever it ended up being. Um, but I think now they should probably do, and it's, it's sad to say, but they should probably do what the Clippers did with Blake Griffin. You recognize, all right, this has been our guy, right? This has been our guy for the better part of the last decade, but we're not winning a championship with the current roster construction right now. I don't think there's any way that Houston can win a championship with this current core because you have obviously John Wall coming in. Okay, that's cool. But you saw how far off they were last year with Westbrook. And I personally think Westbrook is a better player than John Wall because, like I said, we don't even know what we're getting with John Wall. While Westbrook gets a lot of hate, I still think there's some value in what he provides. Wall, we really don't know what he's going to bring. Um, and even if he returns to form, I still don't think the best version of John Wall is better than the best version of Russell Westbrook. But, you know, you can debate that. I don't really think it's going to matter. Um, Houston should probably part ways with Harden and, and start to rebuild or to retool, whatever they want to do. Um, but uh, it doesn't help that there's a public trade request out there that Harden wants to go to Brooklyn because that really limits their options, right? The Blake trade came out of nowhere. If there would have been public rumors that Blake Griffin wants to go to a certain team, they couldn't have gotten what they got from him from Detroit because a team like Detroit would never trade for a superstar that doesn't want to be there or that's going to leave. Obviously, it was a little bit different situation when Blake, he had more years left on his deal. For Harden, it's even worse because he's only got two years left on his deal. What team is going to, you know, unload all the assets to get a disgruntled star who doesn't even want to be there, right? So I think that really hinders what Houston is able to do. Um, but they probably should find a way to part ways with Harden um, and and start the rebuild or at least the retool because I think that they're they're done, man. I don't think that they can can win a championship with the current roster construction. Yeah, and I think 
the best case for Harden is probably to go to the East because there's, you know, there's going to be far less competition as far as like the West teams in the playoffs. And the only team, I know that he's talking about Brooklyn, but the only team that would make a little bit more sense to me is the Sixers. Just based on if you're trading him with, if they want to uh, trade for Simmons, I think that makes more sense for kind of like both teams. Oh, yeah. You can dude. have Simmons. Simmons doesn't need to play point guard. Yeah. For your team. No, Philly should do that, dude. Philly should do that in a heartbeat. And I think if Philly decided, like I said, I'm not in on these conversations. I don't know. But if Philly decided, all right, yeah, we'll part way with Ben Simmons to get James Harden, I really do think that Houston would, would do that in a heartbeat because Ben Simmons alone is worth significantly more than the entire Nets package that they would send over for James Harden. So I think, like you said, that'd be a big win for both teams, right? Uh, Houston gets their guy to start their retool. I think Simmons is a guy that a lot of people would like to play with. So it's not, it's not uh, a type of star player that's really hard to build around. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's great at what he does. Um, but I think for Philly and their roster construction, they probably would need to move in a little bit of better direction. I think Harden would be a significantly better fit than Ben Simmons because that team, I mean, their spacing helps a little bit that they got rid of Horford, but their spacing is pretty horrendous. And if you have Tobias Harris not making shots, which he really has struggled to do since he's got in Philly, um, gotten to Philly is uh, it's going to be it's going to be bad news for them. So it, it would be definitely really interesting to see a swap for you know Harden and Simmons, and and it and it's an easier swap to do contractually because both of those guys are making close to max money. Um, but I don't think Philly's interested, which is is probably an L on their part. Uh, I think they should get in on that, but you know I'm not I'm not their GM. Yeah, just like the similar swap they had with uh, Westbrook and Wall, like. The only issue is that with the Sixers is I don't know how that's going to work with Doc, basically. Well, not I too many people I, work with Doc, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't, we don't got to we don't gotta deal with that anymore. Yeah, we don't got to go back there. Yeah, no we don't got to yeah, go we, back. We keep that but, <laughs> So with the – so I just want to get your kind of like predictions for this upcoming season for the Clippers. Like where do you see them? In the seating, like what players do you think you're going to stand out for the season? Like what's your prediction coming up? Yeah, so I see them getting the second seed again. Um, obviously, the Lakers, they deserve that respect uh, after being the champs and after after getting the one seed pretty easily. I think they, they deserve that respect. And I also think that I think that they're going to be better in the regular season this year than they were last year because Trez and Schroeder are probably going to help them win ball games in the regular season like those are two guys that add a lot of what they did not have last year which was another creator which is Schroeder like aside from aside from him I mean that roster last year they didn't really have anybody else who'd go get their own shot outside of LeBron and AD you know you had Kuzma kind of trying to play that part but but Schroeder's that guy like he can go get his own shot so whether he starts or comes off the bench he's gonna be big for them Trez, as we know, can go get his own baskets. So those two guys are probably going to help them win a lot of regular season games. It's going to be the postseason where those two guys, um, their shortcomings are going to be exposed a little bit more on the defensive end. But uh, I think they will help the Lakers get the one seed. And I also think the Clippers will end up with the two seed again because you're going to have Kawhi not playing back-to-backs. Uh, you know, <clears throat> you got injury concerns, obviously, with Paul George. That's always a concern. Pat Bev. So if they miss any time, you know, it's probably going to be a sem- similar situation that we saw last year where it's like, all right, they're still good enough to get the two seed, but they're probably not going to be healthy enough or available enough to compete for the one seed. Um, But it doesn't really matter, especially with no fans. It's like, it really doesn't matter. Um, As long as they get that top four and don't have to worry about, you know, traveling Um, since we are going to have travel this year. Uh, Players that I expect to stand out. I talked about Luke Kennard. I think he's going to be big. He's going to surprise a lot of people. Um, I really have, high hopes for PG this year. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly what we're going to get from him. I don't think you ever really do because there's obviously a, a lot of different factors with him. But I do think Ty Lue's modern view and modern approach to three-point 
uh, three point efficiency and, and, and three point frequency is going to help PG because he's, he's a fantastic shooter. Um, and him being encouraged to get up 10 threes a game, I think will help him. Um, so those are kind of some of my predictions. I'm not going to predict um, what I think the Clips are going to do in the playoffs because that got me in a little bit of trouble last year. Uh, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just say I, I think they're gonna they're gonna be better than they were last time around. I think everything points to that. Um, but you know we got to see it. Championships aren't one of the off season. They aren't one of the regular season. They're not one around one one around two. Like you you gotta you gotta get through all of those phases and and you know be there standing strong at the end to be able to win a title. And we saw that last year. It's not easy. So uh, I'm not gonna try to predict. Um, you know, where they're going to end up in the playoffs, but I am encouraged by everything that I'm seeing so far. Oh yeah. I'm kind of agreeing with you like a hundred percent. I think they're going to finish similar to where they finished this season. I hope my hope is that the, the health issues for everyone like stays relatively low. Like not, there's not a lot of people sitting out, not a lot of time missed with guys not being able to practice together and things like that but then you know you know myself and joey we're not predicting what's have going to happen in the playoffs we know that they're going to make the playoffs and we hope that they do well in the playoffs but just to make sure that everyone knows like we're not predicting anything that's going to happen in the playoffs because we've seen that before you know as clipper fans we've seen this not once but numerous times in the playoffs so yeah. No, yeah, we're, yeah, we're done, not man. making any. We're predictions scarred, here. man. It's it, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we'll celebrate if and when anything fun happens. But until then, man, I'm not, I can't expect anything anymore, man. It's just <laughs> too much pain, man. Too much pain. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, for the end of this uh, episode, we can talk a little bit about you know our Clipper fandom because I don't know for you, but I think for me that the Lob City error. Like really, really set my Clipper fandom with the team. Like especially even before, because I I was a Clipper fan before they got Blake Griffin, and so him coming to the Clippers just like really elevated my uh, fandom for the Clippers and just like loving the team. Like you know, regardless of all the the missteps and kind of like dis- disappointments. But you know what? What about you, Joey? Yeah, my story's similar. So. um I've told it on a few different podcasts before, but uh, when I was about, because I'm 20 now, so when I was about nine years old, eight, nine years old, my mom, one of her best friends from high school, Mary Brian Cook, who was a former Clipper, um, and obviously wasn't one of the greatest Clippers, but he was on the Clippers. And, and, you know, we spent a lot of time over at his house because my mom was super close with his wife. Um, So I kind of grew up... um, looking up to him like all right like that's an NBA player right you know I didn't know you know for all I all I knew that could have been LeBron you know what I mean it's like for a little kid I was a baseball baseball guy growing up um but my introduction to the NBA was Brian Cook and he was really close with Ryan Gomes and Craig Smith and I got I got a chance to meet those guys like the first ever autograph I got was from Craig Smith on my Clippers hat Gomes signed it cookie signed it so like those were my guys so I started watching the Clippers for Brian Cook Ryan Gomes and Craig Smith because I actually had the chance to meet them and hang around them a little bit well that was the year that Blake was hurt right his rookie his true rookie season where he was hurt so I I watched I think they won like 20 something games um and I remember there was like 20 games to go they were like 20 games back from first and I was still rooting for them to win out and you know make the playoffs um and then the next year was when Blake debuted and that's obviously when I fell in love, man. I mean, I have, this is what basketball was about, man. Like I wanted in and you know, we were lucky, man. We really were spoiled. So to have that as, as somewhat of my introduction to the game of basketball is why I'm so passionate about it, why I love it the way I do. And uh, essentially why I've stuck with the Clippers, man, because you know, I've been through all of the recent heartbreak and collapse. And when they somehow break out of that, whether it's this year you know, next year or sometime when I'm, I'm an old man and they, you know, find a way to, to get out of the second round and, and you know, continue to, to progress. Now I'm going to be hyped, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mean more than if I would have jumped ship and, and gone and, and cheered for the Lakers. You know what I mean? It's just that's, that's how I feel about it, and that's how I'm going to continue to feel about it. So um, also with that being said, Clipper fans 
I can relate to them more, man. It's like, they have accepted me. They have encouraged me. Um, they have really uplifted me throughout my journey as, you know, an analyst, a writer, a video producer, whatever. Um, I don't know if other fan bases would accept me in that way. It's like, you know, Clipper fans, we all kind of have this one thing in common and it's that we've never seen real success before and we're still waiting for that. So we don't have any real um, pride in past accomplishments. We're all living in the moment. It's like anything that, that is going to be successful for us is going to come in the future. Like we don't have any past success. So I think I can relate to Clipper fans a little bit more in that way as well. So yeah, that's kind of a little bit of my rundown on, on my Clipper fandom. Yeah. Cause I was, I was introduced, introduced to basketball in, in 2000 kind of, cause that's like one of the most early memories I have was with the Lakers. So I watched the Lakers kind of like early on during basketball, but then that was, but it was when, I started watching the Clippers too. And then Blake Griffin was on the team that when I kind of switched, like firmly switched my allegiance yeah. to the Clippers. And I, I haven't looked back since, you know, yeah. it's easy. I think it's easy to be a fan of the Lakers, to be honest. Like you have, even though, you know, that stretch run that they had where they were just like terrible for five or no, no longer than that, like five or six years. Yeah, it's like, yeah. You know, they can still look at, oh, we got – they look all these uh, championships right here, like, in the 80s and Dude. 70s Dude. and stuff like that. <laughs> I, see, that's the thing. That's why I don't want to hear the whole, oh, we deserve this. You know, we've held it down for the last, you know, five, six years when we didn't miss the playoffs. Man, when the Clippers were getting bounced out in the second round year after year during that Lava City stretch, you know the highlights we had to look back on? With the sports arena days, with the, with all – those were bad teams, man. Like, the Clippers had no history to look back and be like, oh, you know, remember remember that season? Like, that was really fun. Like, no, dude. Like, they were, they were last in the West every year. It's like for the Lakers, man, they could look back literally – they won a championship in 2010. Like, they literally won a championship, I mean, a decade ago. Yeah, so, it's – it's crazy, man. Like, they, most of their fans remember that. You know what I mean? Like, I remember watching the Lakers win that championship. I was a kid, but I remember it. If the Clippers would have won a championship in 2010, like, I'd still remember it, and I would still watch those highlights, and I would still cherish that. So, I mean, yeah, man, we, we don't need to get into that. But it's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is what that is. Oh, yeah. Like, I think Clipper fans are the most unique fans in sports. You know, if you've been a Clipper fan for – I mean, since a year. the beginning, even like, <laughs> even like a, a couple seasons ago, you understand <laughs> yeah. the type of pain, man. The fun. type of pain you're gonna feel <laughs> because it's gonna be it's gonna be the highest of highs and just like yeah. the lowest of lows. Bad as it gets, man. Yeah, Yo. but if you if you stuck around for this long, I don't think I don't think there's anything that they could do for you to jump ship at this point. No, so yeah, I mean that's where we're at. We're gonna keep riding. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But we're Joey and I. We're excited for this season to start. We can't wait for it to start. You know, hopefully, looking forward to another good season. Not predicting anything. <laughs> just want to make just want to make that clear with people yeah, that no, you know we're not again. predicting. We're predicting a good season. Like that's what we can predict. And like a good playoff performance, but we're not going to predict anything else just to make that like a hundred percent clear with me and joy on this podcast. That's the past, man. That's the past. You want to pull up, you want to pull up old tweets, man. That was, that was the last season. That was, that was last season, man. I haven't, I'm not going to say nothing stuff. about this upcoming year, man. Like I said, I'm encouraged. I'm excited. That's it. Uh, I'm leaving yeah. it at that. Okay. Yeah. And like, thank you, Joy, for coming on to the podcast. I appreciate it. Great to talk to another Clipper fan for this upcoming season. And, you know, before we go, you know, if you want to, whatever you want to plug, whatever you want to promote, you know, go ahead. You're free to do I that. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, for those of you who don't know, I uh, do a lot of stuff on, on, on Twitter, just Joey Lynn underscore. That's where I uh, live tweet games, you know, 
argue with you know people who <laughs> are bringing in false narratives about the clips um so that's kind of where I, I interact on a daily basis i also have my my clips.convos uh instagram page and then also the same the same handle on youtube where i kind of do some more thoughtful breakdowns um and and content in that way so yeah man i appreciate you having me on and uh anytime you guy just feel free to let me know yeah i appreciate it joey you know i'll be sh- i'll be ma- i'll be sure to Whenever you post up new videos on your Clips Convoys, I'll be sure to check it out and shout you out too. But again, thanks, Joey, for being on the podcast. And thanks, everyone, for listening. I know it's going to be a fun, exciting season. That's happened in a couple weeks. And I hope Clipper fans are ready because I hope hope we have something to look forward to. And I'm, I'm excited and Joey's excited. And with that, we will, guys, we will see you next time on the Rob Save Sports podcast.